All right, we're finally doing it. We're doing a range lesson, except we aren't. Today, we're actually gonna talk about why playing in the upper register is not the most important part of your job when you're playing lead trombone. So that example you just heard me playing all four parts for one of my big band arrangements of the tune Dear Old Stockholm, I think is a good illustration of why we need to think that playing high is really not the biggest thing that we need to focus on when we're playing lead. Today's lesson, we're gonna cover the actual important parts about your job and also a little bit about maybe what your job isn't when we're playing this chair. Now, if you're a brass player, this area of your playing, playing the upper register with good control, sound, and intonation is probably something you have spent time on or need to spend time on, myself included. All of us need to work on this area of our musicianship. We will eventually talk about range on this channel, but in the meantime, if you want some input about some real practical ways to work on this that sort of don't assume you're just maybe a natural virtuoso, I am certainly not. I think I have a great serviceable upper register for a professional player that gets good consistency, sound, and intonation, but it's something I've had to work on a lot over the years. If you fall into that category, I really encourage you to check out the virtual studio. You can find the link down in the description. Um, the practice session lesson that accompanies this free YouTube lesson that you can get in the virtual studio, we will cover some of that range stuff along with some of the other concepts that we talk about in today's lesson. Cool, before we get into what our job is, let's talk about the three things that our job is not when we're playing lead. We already mentioned the upper register. Now, yes, you do need to be able to play in the upper register with good control, but rarely do lead charts go above a C or a D as a trombone player. And even getting up to a D, I think, is relatively rare in most typically played charts. We definitely do not have to play as high as we trombone players as we trumpet players do. Because of this, we want to make sure we don't overfocus in that area. And that's the real goal of this lesson, is just to make sure that we keep all of our practice in perspective. I always kind of think that if I have the range to play bolero, I have the range to play lead trombone in most professional big band settings. The second thing that is not your job to do when you're playing lead is to play improvised solos, especially if you're not a super strong improviser. There is no shame in passing off a solo to the second player or maybe even to the third player if either of those players is a good improviser, particularly the third player. They might not have a lot of written solos in their part. So there's no shame in passing that off. It's going to help maybe save your face a little bit. This is particularly true if maybe you have a solo written in the first part that leads right into a shout section. If playing that solo is going to tax you in a way that means the shout, maybe you're going to play a little bit less in tune with a little bit less clear articulation, pass that solo off. Admittedly, I'm somebody who's probably a better soloist than lead player, but when I do end up playing lead, it's not uncommon that I might pass a solo off if there's somebody else in the section that is a good improviser. Just that way, you know, I don't tax my face, I can really focus on what is important. The final thing that is really not so important for us when we're playing lead is to play on a small horn. Now, this is only sort of true. Um, playing on a smaller instrument can help you in certain ways. But for my money, the things you want to consider when you're choosing which instrument to play on which performance are in this order. Number one, intonation. Number two, consistency of sound and response. Number three, ease of section blend. And finally, all the way at number four is sort of creating an idiomatically correct, quote unquote, correct sound. Particularly in the modern context here, there's a wide variety of sounds that we would think of are acceptable uh, sort of lead trombone sounds. Now, if you're playing in some sort of like, you know, sort of throwback type of band, you know, where you're really playing like historical content, maybe it might be better to play a small horn there. But what I would say, regardless of what horn you choose to play, you have to make sure that you practice on it enough so you can play in tune with a good consistent sound and know how to blend with your section. Your section mates will thank you if you are spending that time to make sure that those fundamentals are really under control. Now that we know what our job isn't, let's talk about what our job is when we're playing lead. From my perspective, there are four main things that we need to focus on when we're playing lead trombone. Number one, we gotta tell the rest of the section how to play with how we play. 
Number two and three really go hand in hand. They are to play in time and to play in tune. And then number four is to play as consistently as we can. So let's break down each one of these things and figure out some ways we can practice this stuff and how we think about this stuff when we're in this section. The first and primary part of our job when we're playing lead is to tell the rest of the section how to play by the way that we play. There's nothing worse than playing second underneath a lead player who is playing kind of ineffectually. You just don't know how much forte piano to play, how short an accent to make a marcato on a quarter note. All of these type of things are things that the lead player should be sort of telegraphing to the rest of the section by their playing. Now, some of this comes from lead trumpet, but so many of the times when we're not playing as an entire brass section, it really has got to come from lead trombone. Not only are we trying to tell the rest of our section mates how this stuff is supposed to sound, but when we're actually sending this information out to the audience, we need to remember that a lot of it gets lost over that 50 to 100 feet of kind of transmission. Things like dynamics, articulations, maybe the vibrato, all really needs to be almost overplayed for it to really be present to the listener. Let's look at a little example pulled from that shout section that I played at the beginning of this lesson. And really pay attention to how aggressively I play accents, I play dynamics, particularly forte pianos. Um, you know, all the notes are gonna have a nice little bite on them when they're supposed to, be connected when they're supposed to, so that way the section and the audience is really gonna know what's going on. Cool. So hopefully, if my section mates were sitting next to me, they would know exactly how to play all those elements just by the way I'm playing them. And I'm not sort of trying to be a tyrant or a dictator, it's just that that's my job. If you're playing second or third or bass trombone, you're going to appreciate that the lead player is really laying it down so you know exactly what to do and it's going to make your life easier. Moving on to our next role as a lead player. Now, as I said, number two and three are kind of go hand in hand. That is to play in time and in tune. To say one is more important than the other is a pretty, I think, tough thing to really nail down. We're gonna talk about playing in time first, but these two things really both have to just be on absolute lockdown when you are playing lead. Now, when we're talking about improving our time, we're really talking about how do we learn to play with a more consistent quarter note and place everything in the same place all the time. So the first step we've gotta do is ask ourselves, am I feeling the quarter note in a physical fashion? So when we play in a big band, we are playing with a drummer, playing mostly quarter notes on the ride cymbal. We are playing with a bass player who's playing almost all quarter notes walking. We're playing with a guitar player who's playing almost all quarter notes. We want to connect and actually actively contribute to that quarter note pulse. This means that you need to have a physical sensation about where that beat is. For me, that means tapping my heel. Um, if you are not feeling where the beat is physically, I guarantee you, you are not as with that rhythm section as you think you are. This is originally a dance music that we are playing. And while we don't necessarily dance to it here in the modern context in the way people used to, we still need to connect to that dance sensibility. And the more you can make this a priority in your playing, not just your lead playing, but your overall playing as a musician, you will play so much more in time. So we've got to have a physical connection with where that pulse is. Once we've got that physical connection, then it's time to go to the metronome. So let's look at a little example, again, from this shout section with the metronome practiced in sort of the conventional way with metronome clicks on all four beats. <laughs> Okay, that's probably something that all of us are pretty familiar with. That's kind of the standard way of using the metronome. Now, what we're gonna do to help improve our time is we're gradually going to remove some of that metronome support. So now we're gonna cut our metronome marking in half. So I'm playing this at 150, so we're gonna to go to 75. So we're essentially gonna play it in cut time. Let's hear what that would sound like. Cool, still probably pretty comfortable, especially for feeling that pulse. Now I'm gonna cut that tempo in half again. 
And this time I'm only gonna get a metronome click at the beginning of each bar. So I'm gonna have to be more responsible for all that empty space in between clicks. Am I really keeping a consistent tempo? This is how drummers and bass players practice to improve their time. And we wanna do this well on our instrument. Let's hear what that would sound like. If we're still feeling good there, we can cut it in half again. So we only get a metronome click every two bars. And if the tempo, the original tempo is fast enough, we could even go again. So we only get a metronome click every four bars. Let's hear what it would sound like at two bars. At this tempo, that's probably about as slow as I'm gonna go. And I'm legitimately doing these. I don't have like the metronome clicking four in my uh, headphones. I am really doing this where I am playing with every one bar and every two bars. And you might hear, I get a little less accurate possibly on some of these ones that are more uh, space between each metronome click. So here's a click every two bars. Now I'm doing this on the music I'm working on, but you could easily do this on different scale patterns, articulation patterns, whatever, to really develop your sense of time. That actually might be a better place to do it. Uh, this particular example has a lot of offbeats and a four, and sometimes it could be harder to kind of like check bass. Am I really hitting that downbeat of one every two measures? Now, the other side of sort of, of our importance coin here is playing in tune. Like I said, these two go hand in hand and we can't really think of them as separately. These two fundamentals are just really important for all our musicianship. So obviously we've got to work with the tuner to know where our tuning slide is, you know, check where some of these notes are that have particular tendencies, high Gs, high Fs, high A flats, B flats, all that kind of stuff. You really got to know where that stuff is on your horn. And remember, it's a little different on every horn, different for every player. Um, even different models of the same horn can sit in significantly different places on some of that upper register notes. So just make sure you're really, really familiar with where that is on your horn. Once we have all that stuff kind of under control, then we've got to really think about how do I train my ear to hear intonation? The tuner only helps us so much when we're watching it because we can't tune every note and it's going to go by so fast in performance that you could never use it in that way anyway. So we've got to train our ear and this all comes down to practicing with a drone. This is something that most people are familiar with, but it really does take some time spending with it to really improve at this particular concept. So when I'm using a drone, I really love to use one that is the root, the fifth, and the ninth of whatever key. Now this only really works in major and minor and dominant. If we had something that had like a flat nine or something like that, I suppose you could do it. I've never um, done it in that particular fashion before. But if you have a tuner that will only create a single note drone, that's great as well. So if you're trying to, you know, Tune some stuff that's kind of in the key of A flat, set it to A flat and work from there. But I really love to do it on the root, the fifth and the ninth. So let's hear a scale that's kind of getting up into the upper register with that drone. And I'm gonna go very, very slow. And I'm just going to work to see if I can be really in tune on each one of those notes against the drone. Some of them are gonna be easier to tell. Some of them are gonna be harder to tell. Um, I do think having those three notes makes it a little easier to detect where some of the pitch is sitting. The final thing I'll say about pitch is that remember, your pitch changes all the time. Hot, it's cold, you're tired, you're feeling very fresh. Maybe you've been practicing a lot uh, in the last couple of weeks. Your pitch is probably gonna change. I know when I practice a lot, my tuning slide tends to go out a little bit and then sometimes come back in a little bit over maybe a month period. Just make sure you're constantly checking and even on the gig, it's gonna be in a different place from the beginning of the gig, possibly to the end of the gig. So just make sure you're checking your tuner to, so that your um, tuning slide is in the right place as often as possible. The final component of our job when we are playing lead is to be consistent. I find this to be the hardest part about playing lead. 
we all have ups and downs in our playing as brass players. You know, some days it feels a little better, some days a little worse. Hopefully we can work to minimize those as much as possible. But if you've had maybe four or five days of relatively strenuous playing and then, hey, there's a lead gig at the end of it, that can feel a little bit intimidating. So we wanna find ways to improve that consistency across the entire spectrum of sort of our life as brass players. For me, the best way to do this is actually by kind of like disconnecting that technical part of our brain and really trying to focus more on the musical things. One of the ways that I really love to do this is by working on things that are like singing, then buzzing, then playing. This really kind of helps keep my technique grounded and at the end of the day, I'm trying to think about the sounds that are coming out of my bell rather than so much about what my face is doing. So we're gonna take a little short example. We're gonna take the melody to the Blue Bells of Scotland. You know, classic Arthur Pryor solo. Uh, we're just gonna take the simple part of the melody and just the first little chunk and we are gonna sing it then we're gonna buzz it on our mouthpiece, and then we're gonna play it, and then we're actually gonna move it a little bit more in the upper register. And this way of working can give us some more confidence in that range. So again, we sort of like disconnect from the technique and think just about the music. So we're gonna start in the key that Arthur Pryor plays the simple version of this melody, and that is in F. So what we wanna do is we at least wanna get those first two notes. Now we're not super high in the upper register here, so we might just reference them in the range they are. Now, if this is a melody you don't know, use a simple melody that you know, or you know, play it through once on your horn so that you can sing along. The first thing we wanna do though is sing. And if you're somebody who doesn't feel super confident in your voice, um, there's two pieces of advice I would give you. Number one, take some time to practice it. You don't have to be a great singer. I am not a very good singer and I've never been a very confident singer, but I can at least sing and match pitch and use it as a tool to improve my instrument. Number two is you have to get over it. The biggest thing that helped me become a more confident singer is just to stop worrying about whether I sounded good or not um, using my voice. It's not something that I've ever really enjoyed doing, but as soon as I just sort of like got out of my own head about it, I really realized how important it is to develop that connection for us as brass players, especially since we are the thing that is vibrating and making the sound, much different than a saxophone player or a piano player. So we have to have that connection with our voice. So either way, let's hear those two reference notes again. So we're going from C to F, so we're just gonna sing it on a da. It would be one, two, three. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. I'm not worried about what range I'm in. I'm just worried about am I singing that melody in tune. Then I'm gonna go to the mouthpiece. <laughs> Now you can hear in there, I actually didn't play the repeated notes, those two A naturals. I love to keep my tongue as much out of the equation when I'm doing buzzing stuff as I can. So from there, we're just gonna go to the horn. And again, when we go to the horn, we're trying to connect with, what did I hear? Not so much, what am I doing here? Cool, now that's a great place to start. If you wanna take this in the upper register, just choose whatever key you wanna transpose it into and work it there. We're gonna go up to the key of A flat. So we go from an E flat to an A flat to start. So again, I would get my reference pitches. And I'm gonna sing, buzz, play. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Now I sing that in a lower octave just because that's where my voice sits. Um, but when I buzz it, I'm gonna buzz it in my upper octave. Again, the reason that this technique can be helpful for us is because it helps disconnect our sort of technical analytical brain and helps us focus more on the musical components and just singing a melody through our instrument. Yes, we do need to feed our body with good foundations, breathing exercises, long tones, lip slur exercises, whatever. But then when it comes time to actually perform, we don't wanna think about that stuff. We want that stuff to be the farthest thing from our mind. Maybe breathing and maybe tone. A lot of times I've tried to focus on those are the only things I'm worried about when I'm performing. Is am I getting a good breath and do I hear a good sound coming out of my instrument? But I'm not really thinking about manipulating my face to kind of reach that end. 
All right, that takes care of us for today for this lesson on how to play lead trombone a little bit better. Hopefully things can help you on your next big band gig or even if you're playing in an orchestra or a concert band or in a funk band or a wedding band. All of these concepts are the same. When we are playing lead, we want to play aggressively, in tune, in time, and focus on the music that's coming out of our bell, not so much on the technique of playing high. All right, we'll see you in the woodshed.